So our featured speaker this afternoon will be uh, Helen De Michelle, who's a visiting scholar for the Turnbull Center's Multimedia Journalism Program in Portland, Oregon. Helen has been teaching for the University of Oregon on the topic of participatory media and social practice, in which she engages the students to critically analyze the new participatory media within their own lives and within the context of education. Uh, Helen, why don't you raise your hand, sweetie? Uh, Helen will be followed by John Fenn and I, who will be talking about a hybrid model for offering a field school experience. John is an assistant professor in the Arts Administration program. His background is in folklore, ethnomusicology, and he is the coordinator of the media management area of concentration. Um, our presentation will be followed by a presentation by Julie Volker Morris, who is an instructor for the Arts Administration program, in which she teaches in both lecture, lecture environment and also fully online courses having to do with the topic of art and gender. Uh, Julie will be followed by Randy Sullivan, who is a lecture demonstrator for the University of Oregon Chemistry Department, in which he taps into the power of live, de live demonstrations to illustrate chemical concepts. He goes beyond only live in-person demos, and he also works with online demo, demo modules to prep students for in-class work. So we'll begin with, with Helen, move through the presentations, uh, and then we'll, and then Lee Rumgardner will, from the Teaching Effectiveness Program, will lead some questions and discussion. So again, thanks for being here. I could not be more pleased with the turnout because this demonstrates the interest in this topic on the University of Oregon campus, and I hope this is one of many more of these types of presentations or symposia that will happen in the future. Helen, thanks. Thank you, Doug. I don't think this is working. Keep talking. Okay, do you think it's working now? Oh, there we go. Okay, I really want to thank you, Doug, for the invitation because the invitation was not just to do this symposium, but it did start three years ago when you and John Fenn asked me to create a class that really came out of the kind of work I had been doing as a filmmaker in the online world of multimedia. And so we started in the Arts Administration program, and with the help of Sean Sharp and Robert Volker Morris, I was able to put together a class that has migrated from Arts Administration now into Multimedia Journalism Department. So what I want to do today, quickly in my 15 minutes that I have, is to go over some um, uh, ideas and share some examples from the class in the kind of um, concepts that we went through and the tools that we used and some lessons and questions for the future. I wanted to start with a, a story that I'll always remember about the class that happened this fall. Um, one of our textbooks, we had two books that the class was using, and one of them was Spreadable Media, um, Creating Value and Meaning in a Network Culture. It had just come out in the fall of last year, and I thought it would be perfect for this class. And what we did in the class was alternate chapters of the two books. One was Digital Culture by Charlie Gere, and the other one was Spreadable Media. We didn't read the whole book, we read uh, chapters from one book and then we flip to the other book. Totally different points of view. Well, at some point, uh, I think it was in the fourth week of the class, I received a tweet from one of the authors of the book, randomly, and he said, I see you're using our book for your participatory media and social practice class. Love to hear any thoughts from you or your students. And then I tweeted him back and kind of started a conversation. We talked online through email. And so by the end of um, the quarter, we were able then to actually engage in a Google Hangout-like conversation. The class, probably about eight people in the class were in this video conference with him. And I thought I would just play you a moment from that, but it's gone. John, do you know where my website went? 
And what was really uh, pretty remarkable about this was how the author of the book um, was able to find us online and engage in a conversation with us. And I thought that this was really interesting. Well. They can have forwards of marketing, market research data, but that doesn't actually tell you much. So I, I think. You know, our, our approach with the book was the metaphors we use, the terms we use to describe things, but so much to shape how we define our strategies as content creators and circulators. And so I think it's a great charge to take up to figure that out. And uh, Grace, who's there too, also uh, commented, and she'll bring this up later, about your sensitivity to global audience, global participants. I, I have a quick question, if that's okay. How do you, because I, I find myself in this trap um, all the time at work, and so I'm just, I'd like to just ask a pro how you handle this. How do you not get pigeonholed into kind of one strategy? Because we know it's not one strategy fits all. I mean, that's exactly what you were just saying. But how, like, how do you keep yourself out from the weed, from being in the weeds? Does that make sense? Because I find tough. Myself, it's tough, very tough. I, yeah. I, I recommend two things, and this applies. Mm -hmm no matter if you are in a, a group of people creating media or if you're in a marketing role. The first, I think, is the firm I work for, Peppercom, our tagline is listen, engage, repeat. And because listen, we engage in what? Listen, engage, repeat. Oh, and the okay. repeat just means you can't stop listening. And, and yeah. part of our focus then, because that's our tagline, we go to our clients and say, Listening is not an audit you do at the beginning of this, and in fact, that helps drive the point home that what mm -hmm. you, you could listen to best practices or right. practices. I hate the word best practices. Yeah. I don't think there are any in this space. <laughs> so, um, what happened was the author found us in the larger world that exists out there. We were able as a class to engage with him while reading his book. So there were many, many levels that the students were able to um, really get a different experience than they normally would. So let me go now to um, a background on this class. Uh, it is a survey crash course for graduate students in their first year in multimedia journalism in Portland. It was designed for both multimedia journalists and strategic communication students. I had 25 people in the class. Most of them were professionals who worked full-time jobs and were doing their master's degree um, as part of you know, their life. Um, I myself, as I said, have been working in this space for the last four years myself with a multimedia documentary project, so I'm fairly familiar with it. And what we did was meet three times live in the quarter on Saturdays for five hours, the beginning, the middle, and the end in the group. Those 25 people also were taking other classes together, so they were in a kind of cohort situation and knew one another in real life. So these are kind of, this is the frame um, for what I'm going to be talking about because I think that this interchange of hybrid and online world really made this class a success. We had the, uh, the, the class blog, which is a UO blogs, um, we uh, viewed a lot of online media projects every week. So they would be experiencing these projects, which I'll, I'll show you one of later, and they were required to write 500 word uh, responses to the viewings twice a week and make commentary twice a week, and they were scored on those. They were also asked to summarize the reading at the end of the week. So these students, these graduate students, were doing a lot of writing every week and posting the writings on the website. 
So everybody could read and everybody could comment. Um, they were required to write a midterm paper, around 10 pages long, based on the readings in relationship to the websites that they were, or the web projects that they were experiencing. And then finally, um, throughout the whole quarter, we had a project, a final term project, which was that e each group of four people, so we had five projects, um, were to create a curated uh, website that pulled content from the world of the web and create a piece online and then do a public engagement campaign with it. So for the first five weeks, groups of four people were creating websites and then in the last five weeks, the STRATCOM people kind of led the rest of the project in either online or community engagement events. So it was a pretty rich, intense class. Um, that's kind of some of the background of, of the class itself. Now let me uh, pull up the next slide. So what is the core of what I would say today is how I grounded the class in a kind of reality and context that I thought everybody could um, handle. The course was highly scripted, but at the same time available for imp improvisation as we went along in terms of student responses to the material. I kept the course grounded in um, these three conceptual and practical frames the experience that both I and the students brought to the class, listening to what we knew, speaking from what we know, and our experience as our laboratory in this class. How we dealt with inquiry or education, we created an open space for analysis and reflection. We offered and encouraged a variety of approaches because we were seeing so many different kinds of um, participatory media models online. And we were more interested in looking at what are the questions in this space rather than what are optimal solutions. And finally, what was really overlaying all of it was what is our engagement process. It is a class in participatory media, so engagement was really part of it. Listening, like Sam said, listen, um, engage, iterate, pretty much was the spirit of the class. We explored questions together and everyone's experience ultimately by the end of the projects really brought things together. We used the simple UO blog as our course publishing home base. And we use Twitter, we use Facebook, and YouTube. Um, oftentimes what I would do, probably three times in the quarter, and I was experimenting with this thanks to Robert who gave me this tip, which was, and I'm not really sure if it worked out well, but it was another tool that I brought to the class, which was people wanted more contact, so, on a Monday of every other week, I would sit down in front of the computer and mm, talk about the ideas, the issues, the unresolved problems that were coming up in all of the commentary and writings that the students were doing online and kind of pull it all together in a little talk that usually I try to keep at about five minutes. I do it straight from the computer, and I uploaded it to YouTube, and then I embedded it on the course website. Um, and we Skyped in speakers the three times that we met live. So when we were in our classroom, we Skyped in guest speakers, and those were really pretty amazing to have. Um, in this digital space, when it comes to experience, what I learned and what is so fascinating to me is that we have a generation of people who are very confident about being self-aware in the environment as well as socially aware of how they present themselves and what really seemed to happen through the class and the kinds of international projects that we were looking at become globally aware of their position in this space, in the digital space. So the writings 
were hyper aware. And I think a lot of it had to do with how they deal with social media. They had really an exquisite feel for tone, for their online manners, and also a sense of professionalism. Um, we weren't really only judging the works that we were looking at in the participatory digital space. We were always trying to understand how they function as dialogue. So I guess what I would say is it wasn't a way of being a consumer or an evaluator of these cultural ephemeral projects that we would look at online, but really how do they function in a three-dimensional way um, as dialogue with yourself, dialogue socially among your peers, and dialogue that actually, as you saw with Sam Ford reaching out to us in a gigantic networked relational world. And that to me was really exciting. Um, in terms of the inquiry and the education, I like to look at it as fruitful friction. People took a long time, really, to understand not how to just simply rate what we were looking at. I like it. I don't like it. It's a weird website. It isn't a weird website. It's old. It's new. It's cool. It's not cool. I like the films. I don't like the films. I like the writing. I don't like the writing. None of that. What we really try to do is um, privilege conversation as king conversation around what is going on. What is going on in the space that you're looking at? What is your relationship to it? What is your experience with it? And what are some of the issues? And that really came up, especially when we were dealing with projects like Witness or Engage Media that came from other cultures, other countries, way beyond what we're used to in our assumptions about US digital media. And that was really, really exciting. And one of the big questions that we were looking at as well is what is tech-mediated culture and its relationship to dot, 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 any topic that a student was interested in? You know, what is how technologically mediated culture influencing everything we do. So that saturated the class and really brought up a lot of very interesting dialogue online. And you know that kind of inconclusive, confused friction about international websites really at the end made people even more aware of themselves as global citizens in this environment. And that was very exciting. And at the same time, as we were going along, I think it's really important for you to know that I strictly enforced <laughs> the uh, writing that they had to do and the commentary that people had to do and the summarizing of the text. So we were working on multiple platforms simultaneously. And each one of those um, assignments was scored every week. So I really encouraged people to do all the assignments. And if they didn't, they were not scored for it. And it kept people writing continuously and writing really well and really, really incredible stuff. And I would say to them from the very beginning, this is your portfolio for the rest of your career. Because what you guys are writing about here is really the kinds of issues that you're going to be dealing with as you go out into the world people would sort of shrug their shoulders and say, well, whatever. But then I said, look at it in June of 2014. Go back, print them out, read them as almost a little booklet of your writings, and you will see you have written astounding stuff, truly. And then finally, um, we really were dealing with engagement how to dive into the di digital ecosystem itself, how to swim in it, how to look at it and pull away from it. Many people don't know what the history is of digital culture at all. They really don't know. I mean, we live in such a present and future-oriented space. People don't really understand the historical precedence, where it comes from, how it came out of 
you know, ARPANET and so forth, and really how to be critical or at least see critically where we land today because of what happened in the past. And I think that that was really important for students to learn. And then participate in it which they did, especially when we were in Facebook and Twitter world. And then by the time we got to the final projects, making them and then doing public engagement, community engagement events with that material is actually making a change in the real world. And that was really, really exciting for me. Now let me show you an interesting, if I can find it, uh, yeah. When one of the students wrote her midterm, she decided to submit it as a regular paper, but also to submit it in the blog space. So what she did was write her paper, Emergence of Youth Culture and the Way It Is Changing the World. So she would write and then she embedded various websites. She spoke a little bit more. She used examples from one of our uh, projects that we were looking at in class, which was called Mapping Memories, Experiences of Refugee Youth. She spoke about that. And then she moved on to talk about politics. And all of this is interactive as well. And then she talked a little bit more about social media and Twitter and youth and how youth is sharing and becoming politically active very differently than, than their elders. And she was specifically talking about millennials. And then she wrote a little bit more about it. She pulled a project that I'd been working on and talked about that and she embedded the video. And then finally uh, she ended up talking about comedy online and has a hilarious, I don't know if you've ever seen this piece with Jimmy Fallon and Justin Timberlake about hashtag living. It's really funny. And she ended up then also talking about gaming and how people beta test games and how they learn in this way and multimedia platforms and so on. So anyway, there she is, Lauren Marie Patterson, and that was one way that she did her midterm, although she also submitted it as a regular paper. And I really liked that. It, it was really exciting to see and to read and to interact with myself. So I really liked that. Um, now let me get back. One of the questions that came up when we were really dealing with engagement, which was a huge issue for students in this class, was how do we engage authentically online? How do the encounters that we have online influence our real life encounters, our real life work, how we get a job, and our relationships in the real world as well? I thought that was really interesting because it was a thread that ran through our 10 weeks together. And we also discussed and went into the role of intention when you work online, tone, again, as I brought up before, and your behaviors in the digital ecosystem. Um, and I was really blessed in this class to have a group that you know really behaved pretty professionally and with real sophistication. Um, and I think that in teaching online, in my experience, is if these kinds of um, frames are brought up from the beginning, even undergraduates could rise to the occasion because they're so used to this kind of world already to be hyper aware of these kinds of issues and to rise to a kind of sophisticated way of expressing themselves in this space. Um, at this point, uh, let's say it's about the fifth week, the multimedia journalism students have already created, um, 
their works in progress, which are websites that they've culled content from around the region, around a theme, which I'll show you now. And they were working with the STRATCOM people in their group to decide how to do public engagement. Now, all of them have experience with Twitter and Facebook, and they thought, oh, you know, we won't be able to handle the millions of people who are going to be coming to our websites. And we don't know what to do, so whoa. And um, as they started to realize really, really quickly that if you build it, nobody is going to come, that almost they had to beg, borrow, and steal their friends, colleagues, family to pay attention to what they were doing, which was a huge learning um, experience for people. And um, it was just really interesting for them to realize as strategic communications professionals how in this world right now of, of fake authenticity, how you really, really do have to build real relationships with people to make any of the kind of work that happens online real in the world. And, and uh, uh, continue on. Um, right now, I'm going to let's see. Hmm. Where's my website? Really quickly. briefly, and you can see this all online, to show you one of the final term projects from the students. This was called Northwest Nutria. And really quickly, again, you can look at it this online. Uh, the students actually had a community engagement workshop with people in the community in Portland, and they attracted about 35 people to an event, as well as doing Facebook and Twitter as well. And I'm not going to go through this right now with you, but it's one of four that you can find on the website. And it was very clever and very interesting and done in 10 weeks. Um, and finally, uh, what I'd like to say is that I came up with some uh, lessons learned which I'm going to go through very quickly, and we can talk about when um, we have our question and answers. Um, questions to consider is, if you're thinking about innovating in this space, is it appropriate, really, for your course to be online? Can you really begin with small steps to test it out using tools, skill sets, techniques, topics, or concepts in a kind of step fashion? Can you bring in campus or community members to help you and give you guidance? Are there other scholars in that really could work with you? I found that really, really helpful to bring in other professionals, guest speakers, and people that I knew outside of the university to help out. Um, innovation doesn't really happen in a bubble. We have intense collaborations. We um, felt that it was really important to expand the network to bring in developers, programmers, computer scientists who may be relevant to the kind of innovation that you're interested in doing. And also to encourage partnering. Really, really important to develop a kind of online service learning component for the students. Um, I think that from my experience, I would say that it's really important to be flexible with the course content and always be able to respond to student interests. And for me, it was really helpful to use existing resources and tools that the students themselves are comfortable with, competent with, and have the capacity to use like that. WordPress, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. Really, really important. And for me also, I kept a weekly report and journal on my own um, learnings from this class because I wasn't going to remember everything. And I could use that in the end 
to understand what I was learning from this class for research, writing, and funding. And finally, I want to end up saying, make no mistake, planning an online course like this and teaching it really does take a lot of time. Um, be prepared to be present with your students daily, hourly, you know, we're on 24-7, have encounters that are very intense through all these various platforms that we can use. Um, and I would also say that to consider the possibility for team teaching in a course um, and look for university support through the various systems that we have available because it really is probably, mm, as I think Robert and I figured out, 15 to 20 hours a week of work for one class. And the kind of funding that can be able to be found for this sort of course development is also really important. Um, and that's it for me, except I do have one final thing to say as we're in this digital world, we're driving on a dark free highway, right? And we see nothing. The headlights only shine in certain areas and that's what we can see. It's very dark out there except for what we see in the headlights. Given that though, what's really exquisite about doing this kind of teaching is you can drive a thousand miles no matter what in that kind of an environment. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thanks everyone for coming. My name is John Fenn. Um, and uh, Doug and I are going to do a tag team presentation here today, uh, modeled on a, a diamond session we had done at the Educause uh, Portland conference uh, two years ago. Um, and so I'm just going to explain briefly what's going on here. Um, the presentation has about six slides, and they're going to run through a cycle. We're not going to speak directly to them, although we will be speaking about all of them. It'll probably loop three or four times while we're talking. Um, one of them will have some, some uh, questions that we'll kind of address at the end, and it will loop back to the discussion, I think. Uh, the field school that we've developed, that we uh, designed and facilitated and ran in the summer of 2011, is connected directly to China Vine, a uh, uh, transnational, collaborative, um, web-based interpretation of Chinese cultural heritage that Doug has been involved with since 2006, yeah. and I became involved with in 2009. So um, we designed this uh, field school called Public Cultural and Heritage, a Beijing field school, in order to integrate student participation more formally into the ongoing um, research project of China Vine. So uh, up until that point, students had been involved in helping prepare content, had gone on field trips in an informal manner with faculty when they led them over to China to do research. But we wanted to try to build a, a, a more formal frame for students to both have the experience of doing field work and then create content that would go online through either EduVine or ChinaVine and at the time a, a, a other portal called Vine Online. Um, we very much envisioned this field school as a hybrid space that would involve uh, a, a two-week residency in Beijing where we would be there with the students doing ethnographic field work and then two weeks on either side that would be facilitated online. And so it would be a six-week field school in total. Um, I think it carried six credits, I believe. Um, so today in this presentation, we're going to focus on this hybrid environment and its relationship to engagement, to follow up on some themes that Helen introduced us to, um, engagement with and through the technologically mediated space of, 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 of the, the hybrid um, course. So I'm going to talk uh, first about the pre-residency um, component of, of the field school. So again, there were these three phases. Pre-residency was the first one. Um, this we ran as a two-week online orientation via a WordPress site that Doug and I built together. And uh, during this two weeks, we introduced students to um, sort of important themes and concepts, both doing folkloristically driven field work as well as research specifically in China. So we had readings that we posted to the course site. There was a book that we, rec or we required them to purchase and we all read together in the last week of, of this online orientation. Um, and we had a series of assignments that they were to post um, material directly to the course site during this two week orientation. Um, the this allowed for asynchronous and individually paced completion of the assignments. Uh, it turns out that several of our students were Chinese nationals and they wanted to go home for the summer. So they were actually taking this part of the class from Beijing while we were facilitating it here in Oregon. So our time frame, as Helen mentioned, just with hers, you know, 24-7, we had to 
you know, a due date of <laughs> 8 p.m. on the Thursday was, you know, had to be stretched by nine hours. Um, so we were able to kind of navigate that in this online environment pretty easily, I think. Um, it allowed students to stay connected to issues to, and to each other before they ever met in, in the field. And so none of the a couple of students knew each other beforehand, but not all of them. So it allowed them to kind of get to know each other. And we specifically designed some of the assignments that they were posting to on the course site in order to introduce each other. Uh, so one of the assignments was to share a family recipe and, and, and talk about its significance in your family heritage. Um, we knew we were going to be doing some field work that involved food in China. And then we also asked everyone to share a family photograph and discuss, um, answer some specific questions about history and the relationship of that photo to documenting history, because we knew we were going to be using a lot of photography and digital media in the field. So we wanted to get them used to the tools that folklorists and other cultural field workers use um, in terms of interpreting heritage. Um, just a brief uh, demographic of the class. It was a mix of graduate and undergraduate students from from folklore and arts administration, but also a range of other disciplines and departments here on campus that we didn't really predict or have um, a lot of sense of where we were gonna draw students from. So um, across the, the, the pre-residency though, I would say that the, the themes of engagement were definitely facilitated by the use of WordPress and by the use of, um, by the employment of the assignments that we gave them. So in terms of the residency it's, itself, mm -hmm. Uh, the field school was embedded, as John said, for two full weeks. We were located in central Beijing, and if you're familiar with Beijing, near the second ring road. And we lived in a hutong neighborhood, or an alleyway neighborhood, in a, in a traditional Chinese uh, house that had been repurposed to uh, be a, a dormitory hotel for initiatives of this type. So from this location, though, we then traveled to the outskirts of Beijing to two locations. One, Jiangao, which is a pilgrimage destination situated near an important temple with a nascent tourist industry. And also Songzhang, which is a cluster of villages that has become home to several thousand contemporary artists and has become a, a site in which museums and galleries are being built and is also becoming a destination point. At these sites, our students were asked to do interviews with residents um, and, do, and document the sites through field notes, audio recordings, videos, still photographs, and they also carried uh, sketchbooks. Simultaneously, they were using social media in both the United States and China to document the field work that they were doing. On a daily basis, we met with the students to do an analysis and interpretation of what was experienced as a large group and then the students began working in two teams doing more specific analysis and interpretation related to assignments that would be associated with the post-residency. In addition to the field work in Jiangao and Songzhang, the students engaged in informal field work, which they documented within the, the Hutong and elsewhere in Beijing, such as meals that they participated in, shopping, observations in parks, and we had one student who was tattooed and that was documented as well. Um, and this was all made available through the social media through, through, through the website. So at the end of the, the two-week residency period, we all said goodbye to each other. Um, a few of us traveled directly back to the United States and others st stuck around in China or traveled elsewhere. And the next two-week phase of the field school was the post-residency that happened about 10 days after we, we all said goodbye to each other on the last day in Beijing. So we allowed some time, flexibility for students to get back to where they're going and then also to kind of process or extend their experience of traveling through China. So in, in this post-residency um, period, we, the, the, the main assignment was for them to pull together two posts based on the two field work sites in these teams that Doug just described. So a graduate student was, was the team leader for each of these teams, and via email, the WordPress site, um, Vimeo, and other online tools, they were sharing um, materials, editing, uh, using Flickr as well, um, editing the materials into a post that then we were, dra we were commenting on via the WordPress feature. So they were putting it in the background. They weren't published yet. They were in draft form. We could go see them and offer feedback and comments. So we were relying again on this sort of asynchronous uh, um, uh, kind of integrated system of publishing that when they finally got after, at the end of that two-week period, they, each team had produced two full drafts and we said, go, hit publish. They published them and they were syndicated into the Vine Online site, which again is an auxiliary of China Vine at that point. 
Um, and so they then produced fully um, interactive uh, multimedia web-based content based on their experiences doing this field work. So um, they were working all over the world. None of them were in the same physical space, so that was kind of important to remember. They were um, dividing the editing and production tasks according to the team's needs and resources based on treatments that they had pitched to us in the last couple days of, of, of our residency in Beijing. So they weren't just flying blind here. Um, and the engagement extended through the material they produced, but also their reflections on it. And so those reflections took the form of posts that they were doing in between the work, as well as um, sort of anecdotes they were feeding back to us via email, and then finally through the course evaluations. So we, we got pretty strong feedback as to how the, the flexibility and the sort of asynchronous component of this, of them being able to work when and where they, they were, um, uh, but in teams and collaboratively, what added, added value to the fieldwork experience in general. And so I think the post-residency kind of led us into thinking about what this hybrid structure would enable us to do. So some of the conclusions that we came away with, and, and both John and I have backgrounds where we've been associated with field schools, and so this was a new endeavor for us is to think about a traditional field school model and how to move it into this, this more hybridized environment. So what we came away believing is that a mix of emerging and established technologies in a field school context can extend the engagement factor beyond the traditional time frame of the course or other academic educational unit. And I think John alluded to this when he talked about the additional time that students were spending in China after the, the residential portion of the field school, as well as what was happening during the field school during the, students having, during the free time that students were engaging with. We also discovered that combining online tools with face-to-face -face work and travel permits students and faculty alike to participate in a range of ways that will likely move beyond the official end of the field school and locate learning across multiple places and times. Several students, for example, expressed interest in continuing to work with the China Vine Project and, and did so following the field school. We also came away believing that developing a flexible format regarding technology and teaching gives students room to feel comfortable using existing skills as well as exploring new opportunities. So instead of setting out to teach specific technologies, and I think this is an important point that we'd like to make, it encouraged students to utilize tools for communicating, interpreting, and publishing that were both familiar and unfamiliar. And as such, peer learning emerged as an important component of engagement throughout the field school. And what we, want, what we did was we cultivated students' interest in using tools at hands to do documentary work. For example, many of them had cell phone cameras or smartphones that they brought into the field with them and used as part of the process. And one of the things that we tried to concentrate on was actually the use of mini media throughout the field school and trying to find devices that were as uh, non-intrusive as possible. We also came away believing that engagement can be both transnational and localized in the model we, we are proposing. Students gathered online prior to our two-week residency, becoming familiar with relevant materials and each other before gathering face-to-face -face in Beijing. And then after dispersing, they came together once more online in order const to construct their final postings. These postings as nodes of entries into China's cultural heritage for other learners not affiliated with the field school continue to extend the cultural engagement beyond the confines of the field school through the use of the interactivity built into the platform supporting the interpretation that the students did. Given that students knew from the beginning that their transmedia interpretations would be posted to the China Vine project, supported an author authentic learning experience that is associated with field schools generally and certainly of the type that we were associated, that we helped facilitate. And then finally, we acknowledge the constraints of technological and cultural systems that we worked with while offering approaches to balanced and thoughtful interpretation. For example, ultimately, the material posted by students draws on text and images, whether that be still or moving, to represent cultural environments and practices in rich stimuli. As powerful as the web is at this point, distributing knowledge and media, there are not tools to articulate things like smells or task the tactile aspects of what we brought our students' attention to within the field school. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, I'm Julie Volker Morris. I'm an instructor in arts administration and to date I've not had the fortune to go to China with Doug and John, but I have had the opportunity to um, virtually experience China Vine, which I'm going to be talking about further, particularly related to Edgevine, which is one piece of the China Vine site. And um, I've been an instructor participant in this way. Um, so Edgevine is a self-guided interactive educational folk art curriculum. It's based on the notion that you learn about yourself as you learn about others. The cultural explorations and challenges presented ask participants to explore new ways of creating visual and text-based responses as it utilizes China Vine's open source materials. And additionally, um, graduate students on the, oops, excuse me, I forgot to push play here. Um, graduate students on the China Vine Edivine team have created curriculums for K through 12 students to use in classroom settings. So this has been supported by funding from the National Endowment for the Arts as well as the National Art Education Foundation. I reviewed some of the upper level secondary lesson plans and revised them, extended them, expanded them for a 200 level survey course centered on topics of art and gender. In particular, I revised these outlines taking into consideration students in my course who are participating in first year interest programs at the UO and students in my course sections who are Chinese. I often teach towards student experience and background as a starting point to building additional cultural exploration and self-reflective components into student coursework. So uh, a little bit of background, um, several of my colleagues are actually here today in the 200 level um, instructional program of the Arts Administration program have been looking for ways to be more inclusive and welcoming to our ever-growing Chinese student roster. And um, for many terms, particularly for me beginning in the summer of 2012, nearly half of the students registered in my online courses um, that hold about 40 have been Chinese students. And um, in discussing such concerns, Doug and I talked, a uh, colleague Liz Hoffman and uh, Kristen Congdon of the University of Central Florida suggested that I have students participate and post in China Vine. Um, so since China Vine's mission is to share information and educate English speaking audiences about China's cultural heritage, this seemed a pretty good match. So I think part of the responsibility of being a student at the UO is to share research and scholarship to wider audiences. So in this case, students have the opportunity to actually share with a global community. Uh, public interactive websites depend on participant audiences for their success, so I thought this introduction to China Vine would also provide motivation for future student visits and participation in the China Vine site. Liz, my colleague that I mentioned, ran a pilot program um, assignment, really, um, based on this suggestion during the summer of 2012, and I've continued with two separate types of assignments related to the Edge of Vine portion of China Vine uh, since that time, not during every term, but um, when I have, they've had positive feedback. Um, both assignments I've used are drawn from the Edgevine curriculum section regarding cultural representations and folk art that you see her here. And while folk art can be highly innovative, it's rooted in a particular cultural context. This session of um, lessons demonstrates how folk art is linked to traditional ways of living and understanding the world. And in the two assignments that I have uh, worked with, students are asked to read the articles, watch related videos, and other collected materials on China Vine. Um, both deal with uh, traditionally gendered objects such as dowry needle and thread boxes and insole embroidery, uh, insole embroidery art. I'll just show you an example of this here with the insoles. And Here are a few of Li Rofen's uh, examples of her insole embroidery. This is a traditional practice passed down from the Han Dynasty and um, often contain uh, images that are very um, pertinent to uh, prosperity, success, uh, marriage, and love. Uh, the purpose of these si assignments that I've used is to bring together students' thoughts on gender in their own lives, as well as related to other cultures. They research a topic, post findings to course colleagues, and then post to a wider audience on China Vine. And I'm going to talk a bit about one assignment in particular. Um, as we know, all cultures have valued objects that are placed in specialized containers or that through decoration are significant symbols of status and belonging. If we think about the objects placed in containers, these are often tools of everyday items with sentimental value. 
Um, many of you probably know that MIT professor Sherry Turkle edited a book uh, titled Evocative Objects, Things We Think With. It's full of essays on everyday objects such as ballet slippers, the radio, the vacuum cleaner, and a rolling pin. Um, she makes it clear that ordinary items can take on special meaning. Turkle says, life is not lived in discrete stages, nor are the relationships with objects that accompany its journey. Objects have life roles that are multiple and fluid. She recognizes that an object that might mean little to one person can be valued by someone else due to the way in which it functions in that person's life. Sometimes these objects are recognized as valuable by being placed in special containers. When they're passed from generation to generation, their historical value can be increased. In the United States, prized possessions may be kept in a cigar box or a shoe box, but often the containers are specially designed for their contact contents, I think, especially in today's Pinterest world. Uh, some containers are more highly valued than others. For instance, a tackle box may house treasured fishing lures, or a cedar chest may contain family linens or quilts. In particular, for the class, we focus how on each of these items may be gendered. Um, students uh, read China Vine links associated with the thread boxes. Oh, this is not quite linking out here. Here we go. Um, and they um, look at some of the videos that have been posted, such as this one, which walks them through how uh, the needle and thread boxes by Sehi Kyung and uh, Sun Xie Ying are primarily dowry boxes made to contain special um, items that a young girl would take with her. Sorry, this is not playing. All right, I'm going to leave that for you and move on. Um, but um, I do recommend going to the China Vine site to um, watch this because it's fascinating how they take the, um, the paper and the um, rope and turn it into the boxes, and do the embroidery and um, the, the paper making that's applied there. <laughs> All right. After reading the associated links, viewing videos, and researching the topic, students write ideas on the subject with a focus on art and gender. They include how this topic is relevant to them personally. And then following that introduction to the content, students then select one question to explore in greater detail and write a brief discussion related to their research about the question. Questions include such things as, what textual or subtextual gendered messages regarding place, function, and the like might be found in boxes? Why boxes may be seen by some as a place to display status, wealth, or gender, often at the expense of personal comfort. In what ways boxes relate to gendered ideals of beauty and sexuality and are sometimes considered in sexual terms and language, whether that's as hot box girls, pseudonyms for uh, the vagina, and so forth. Or what sorts of human behavior historically and currently are related to boxes. Um, students then um, further explore these questions as related to the work of other artists and how they work with um, boxes such as Nicario Jimenez, who makes boxes retables um, that hold stories, Molly Doctoro, who makes boxes for nature trails and nature shrines, Joseph Cornell, who was a folk artist working uh, primarily in assemblage, John Frame, uh, exploring um, wide variety of things through a stop um, animated motion piece that he's been working on since 2006 and each um, box and other kinds of sculptural pieces stand on their own as artworks. Uh, Frank de la Misertis Priority Boxes Art Project which sends messages of peace and hope. They're actually empty boxes but they're um, sending the art as that message of peace and hope and what does that mean um, as we live in a fragile society. And then uh, works by Poran Chin Chi, who is an Iranian-born New York artist um, who explores forms of language as subject matter. So these um, connect to coursework on the power of language in creative gender experience, expression, and behavior. Students write a short paragraph that connects um, one of these things about the artists that they've examined um, with what they just composed after looking at the China Vine site about the Chinese needle and thread boxes. And suggested forms this might take uh, are for them to share a personal narrative, propose questions, or share a th uh, theory or ask for comments. Um, with both of these assignments, whether with the needle and thread boxes or the insole embroidery, um, it's important for um, us in the class to talk about how traditionally 
young girls needed to be skilled at sewing and other crafts. Therefore, needle and thread become important items to take into adulthood. And with the insole embroidery assignment, um, we consider fashion and gendered appearances related to feet because insoles are about comfort, but also about other things. We look at questions similar to those of the needle and thread boxes, including questions of collection, particularly for sneakerhead culture, how footwear can display status and wealth or sexuality, often at the expense of personal comfort, whether through foot binding or Christian Louis Vuitton shoes, how foot care uh, with pedicures and fashion related to gender ideals of beauty, human behavior, and sexuality. Um, students have taken this further to find um, out and think about how um, things are maybe specially created today. They're not always handcrafted, maybe through the Nike O uh, shoe of your choice. Um, and as they're also finding that um, the older insole uh, styles are being restyled as manufactured outerwear. So for the needle and thread boxes assignment, um, students in my fig heavy courses, because sometimes I'll have 50 out of 80 students in a class who are in a fig, um, and I think that's important to be thinking about audience, um, are asked to imagine that they could have any kind of object or tool they might desire to get what they want, where they, where they want to be in their career. For example, these could be laboratory items needed to become a doctor or a scientist, tools to fix your car, or instruments needed to become a musician. So we talk about what kinds of tools or objects are important in their culture for success as an adult, and what kinds of objects or tools are important in their culture for success as a gendered person. So how might these objects or tools be important to pass on to their children or to young people in the next generation? For the insole embroidery assignment, um, they are to do similar work related to insole design as well. So um, a few findings at this point. Um, that I think there's a wealth of discussion fodder regarding fashion and feet, gendered objects, and career and life planning that have been yielded. Um, some interesting items brought forward about themselves as students um, as they've learned through this process of looking at uh, the Edgevine and China Vine sites. Um, some Chinese students had never heard of insole embroidery before. Other Chinese students have a special pair of insoles made by their grandmother that they never wear, but they cherish very much. Uh, the Chinese students were also quite diverse in their response to the topic, several disliking insole embroidery or the needle and thread boxes because of their rural, traditional, unfashionable association, while others thought of them as nationally treasured skills to be protected. American students are amazed by the skill of these artists and wish that such practices, traditions, and skills were celebrated within American culture. One student noted that from insoles and boxes, on the one hand, we can see the gender discrimination against women in the traditional Chinese culture. On the other hand, thanks to this culture and expectations of gendered activities or objects like this, we can preserve these beautiful handcrafted objects um, and the silk um, style and practice and skill. Um, oh, here's the quote from him. Uh, just like what we see from China Vine, the makers are all ladies and they are old. Young people are not a fan to do this job. The normal insoles are easy and selling fast, so the traditional ones need a skilled maker. How do we recognize and preserve that? Then in another vein, many of the self-identified sneakerheads have been Chinese students, while often for US students, it's been their friend who is the sneakerhead. A Chinese student stated that when he collects sneakers, he's also collecting the history of great moments of athletes' careers. When relatives create, save, and or collect family insoles or the needle boxes, they are reminded of the rites of passage, such as weddings at which they are given. In each case, the object becomes a keepsake for a special event. Comparing athletic designer shoes, such as Air Jordans or other Nikes, and um, designer shoes such as Louis Vuitton's with Chinese insole embroidery, an American student suggested that Western philosophy was to display status and prosperity, while Eastern philosophy was to hide it and share it only with family and friends when the shoes came off and the insoles were revealed. Um, a Chinese student kind of countered that in the discussion, noting that yes, personal affections were communicated through gifting of insoles or boxes between people, a wordless act that's sometimes stronger than normal communications. This student's question um, was how much a Western viewer could understand the Chinese way of presenting emotion. He noted that, I hate people with very obvious personality. I prefer more indirect ways of communication as the insult to Chinese, because sometimes when you get so close to someone, you just feel so bored in this relationship. <laughs> Couple more things. Um, ref referring to one of our readings on fashion, a Chinese student noted that Bernard mentioned fashion design is much of 
art is painting or sculpture. In this context, the student suggested that designing high heels is a process of art design, and that the collecting of high heels is a way to exhibit works of art. The student suggested that collecting high heels is basically collecting and exhibiting art. Therefore, the wardrobe is a small museum of those special collectors. The exhibition is a way to express collectors' value of gender, particularly related to femininity as it, as it is normalized today. And um, a final example from a student, um, he was looking at Back to the Future, and he's a, a major sneakerhead, loves Nikes. And um, these are actually coming out on the market in 2015. You can get your own pair. They will snap on. Um, sometimes a pair of shoes actually contains a lot of things, such as art, gendered meanings, traditional classical meanings for culture, market value, and ideas for the future. It's not only shoes, it's also life. So overall, with this um, connection to China Vine that I um, provide in these assignments, I hope that students' engagement with these online resources help to foster a sense of critical reflection of their identities that leads to better understanding of prescribed gender identities within diverse and shared cultural experiences. Thank you. Uh, I'm Randy Sullivan. I'm an instructor in the chemistry department. And uh, I do instructional support for uh, our very large enrollment courses, uh, general chemistry, uh, organic chemistry, and then those, those are our large enrollment ones that I mainly work with. And part of that's uh, my title is lecture demonstrator because a big part of that is doing lecture demonstrations for them. But I've diversified into some other forms of instructional support for them, including I uh, supervise and run the uh, peer learning program, uh, which we've got a fairly large peer learning program. And uh, my, um, my, I want to talk to you about a project that I'm doing related to that. But before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of background about uh, some things I hold to be axiomatic about online learning that have kind of guided me. And, and I, I'm not an re educational researcher, so I don't know if this is all grounded in fact or not. But just, I have had some experience in, some, in, in education and, some, and some, hopefully I have some insights that might be of use to you. Uh, one thing that has kind of guides me throughout this is remembering that the teacher-learner relationship is anthropologically embedded in human beings. It is arguably one of the things that makes us human, the transmission of knowledge and culture in a teacher-learner relationship. In fact, probably even has a primate basis in it. And that in we are hardwired, most of us, to crave a teacher-learner relationship, an authentic teacher-learner relationship. As we go into using virtual tools, we need to remember that each degree of virtuality which we introduce brings in opportunities, and, but is fraught with danger of losing the authenticity of the relationship between the teacher and the le learner. Uh, this is, has its parallels in, in acting. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Andy Warhol, somebody correct me if it wasn't, uh, who said that uh, theater is life, cinema is art, and television is furniture. <laughs> uh, there's a similar process that goes on in virtual learning that we need to be aware of. Um, each step we become removed from the actual presence of a human being in front of us engaged in the teacher-learner relationship has a danger of losing engagement, uh, losing the emotional and social connectivity involved in it. Of course, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Socrates, for example, objected to writing. He said, how, how can you learn from somebody who's not there? You can't do it, right? <laughs> They've got to be there. Uh, but beginning with writing and pr then printing, and then on up into the modern age, we've got to come up with these various, way various ways. And they're great tools for establishing new relationships. We can have a relationship with a writer who's long dead through writing and, and printing. Um, so th that's one of the things that's guided me, is how can we use virtuality uh, and some of the other uh, speakers were talking about this, to enhance authentic relationships. 
and particularly also how to scaffold the skills that students need to engage in those authentic relationships. I have a colleague who teaches a class who's very old school, and he's like, I don't want any of this online discussion board chat stuff. I want them to stand up in class and ask them a question. I go, that's, that's great, that's a good skill. How do you teach them that? And he goes, well, I make them stand up in class and ask, ask questions. And I said, it's a good thing you're not teaching swimming. <laughs> if we expect students to do these higher level authentic, engage in higher level authentic academic relationships, which we should be part of our program, we need to teach that. We need to scaffold that and thoughtfully use the technology as a tool to do that. Uh, you can use, when you, when you use technology, you, there's three ways you can take it. It can either be neutral. It can displace authentic relationships, which I think is, for some of us, is the fear. It was certainly his fear. I don't want it to displace, displace what I consider to be an authentic relationship with the material and with each other. Or we can use it to scaffold and enhance those behaviors. And that's been the guiding principle behind my project. Uh, and, and how I engage with this material. I'll walk briefly through the project, keeping in mind the time constraints, and then we can move on into discussion, I think. And this is going to have to be higher. And asynchronous back-channel communications is quite a mouth mouthful. We'll see if we can unpack that a little bit. Uh, the, pro the project I was working on is I call the virtual discussion section. Some of you may be aware that there's a dilemma in higher education sometimes. We have these huge, we, due to increasing enrollment, we have these huge courses, and sometimes due to uh, restraints on uh, resources. We used to have these things called discussion sections. If you had a big course, you broke up, and a lot of courses still do, break up into a smaller group and talk about it. In the sciences, those were traditionally the places where metacognitive skills uh, involving study, uh, are inv involving problem solving, were directly taught. Uh, but that's kind of gone by the wayside. So I was, how do you reintroduce that, and how can we use uh, uh, a an online platform to reintroduce that? The working hypothesis I had was the primate the primate factor that I was talking about. I'm going to go through these pretty quick, I hope it doesn't frustrate you. Uh, teach them how to fish, don't teach them chemistry, but teach them how to solve the metacognitive skills involved in, in how to solve chemistry problems so that they can do it on their own. In other words, teach yourself out of a job. Uh, whatever the platform needs to be, needs to be free, intuitive, no downloads. Everybody, don't make your students download things. They need to, it needs to be web-based, if possible. Needs quality production, well, we worked on it. And it needs to be in a time and place that students, meet students in the time and place where they are. Uh, and so we came up with a web-based interactive streaming video problem-solving sessions weekly uh, that I call the virtual discussion section. Uh, the system worked like this. Here's me at the chalkboard. Uh, here's a mic and a camera. Yeah, that's virtual me. Um, here's my computer and it has a flash video encoder in it, sending it a stream to Justin TV, who then distributes it to the students. Uh, they get all the audio video stream on their computer. Uh, they call or chat questions to engage and engage in back to either questions to me or back channel chat. We'll talk more about that. That's an important part of it. Um, I received the communications through the chat bar and conference phone. I actually had an assistant that was screening them and would forward questions to me. Yeah. And that was the system. Uh, that was the way it was supposed to work. Um, and this is what the interface kind of looked like. Um, gonna yell here for a second here. Um, here's me going yada yada up at the board, uh, talking through problems, problem solving skills with them. Here the students could chat in and synchronously uh, it would display what they were chatting about. Uh, this, I found out, first of all, very few people called in. Um, that probably makes it difficult for you to record this, doesn't it? I better take this. Very few people called in. 
Um, but a lot of chatting, and I, I had envisioned, instructor that I am, thinking the world revolves around me, of course they're going to chat and ask me questions, right? What did they do? Tell me. They chatted each other. <laughs> they were doing back channel communications. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And I said, they're asking good stuff on these back channel communications, and they're giving each other good answers. And I said, I got to thinking about back channel communications, because in the lecture course, it's problematic. There's back channel communications going on all the time. They're getting to where they chat each other, which is a little bit dis disruptive, but all, through all, out all our life, it was like, what's he, ta what's he talking about? <laughs> I don't know. And, and, they, and you know, it's like that little whisper in the background. A lot of times, it is actually about what you're talking about. They're doing some, some back channel chat on it. So that's interesting. We'll come back to the back channel stuff, because I want to enhance that. That's interactivity. That's learning. So uh, we did, uh, Julie Mueller over at the Teaching Effectiveness Program helped me out on this, and I want to thank her for that. Uh, we, got, we surveyed and did, a, did an assessment of the program. After a year, 85, or two, two full quarters doing it, 85% found it helpful, 70, I won't read it to you, da 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 da. 94% thought it, be, it should be continued. It, basically pretty successful. Here's some interesting stuff. 89% felt more confident asking questions in the VDS than in lecture. Well, never let, I'm just going to let this sit for a second. This is where the scaffolding that I was talking about, I think, comes in. I don't have data yet. We'll try to see if we can get that. But I have a hunch that after you've asked questions online for a while, you're going to feel a little bit more confident in the office hour or uh, in, the, uh, in the lecture asking questions. I saw, saw an intimation of this once when I saw an instructor who was asking clicker tech questions along, quite a bit in her class. And uh, it got about uh, halfway through the quarter. And of course, always happens, right? The clicker system, eye clicker system broke down, wasn't working that day. And she said, well, I'm just going to ask you the question. She asked some question on the content and said, let's just get a show of hands. And like, I was, I do demos, so I spend a lot of time watching the class. And she got like an 80% response rate on hand raising. Now, I don't know how many of you guys are instructors. You never get 80% of kids, uh, students, to raise their hands for anything. Why did they do that? Because they had been scaffolded by the eye clicker. They grew, had grown confident that it's okay to respond, even though it went from anonymous to non anonymous. Non anonymous? I think I invented that word. So here's some surprises that I found. Uh, the chat use was more than the call in. People liked the interactive anonymity. I was surprised by the, ex and the here's an interesting thing. A lot more people were watching it. I was thinking, oh, live, it has to be live. More people were watching it after the fact. Of course, you couldn't call in then, but they were watching other people. They were watching their peers call in or chat in. More people were doing it, reviewing it, than were tuning into it in the first place. The other thing was the extent of back channel conversations. And I was surprised at the high level, level of reported effectiveness. So I have been following up on that since then. I said, well, maybe the live feature isn't that important. So I, as I said, I supervise, since then I've started supervising the peer learning program, so I just have them uh, doing the peer learning, uh, uh, filming, and Andre Chin uh, has come in and started filming some of the peer learning stuff. And, uh, but here's the thing, I want to do back channel chat streams that are linked temporally to the video stream. I want students who are watching the video stream asynchronously to be able to tag it and make a comment here. Next student comes along watching the stream, that fl tag flashes up on the bar. You may not be interested in what I'm talking about, but students are almost always interested in their other students' meta-narrative of what I'm talking about. They want to know what other students are saying about what I'm talking about. You know which is what was going on on the sidebar chat. 
So yeah, that's what I've been working on. Uh, try, I, I see, haven't found a platform that can do that yet. Uh, I've tried Google Hangouts and VoiceThread, but they're not quite, not quite there. Uh, because I want to combine the human presence of video with that of interactive chat. And so, I, we, yeah, we'll, we'll stop it there so that we can get into questions and answers for the panel. Thank you. love to see a showcase of this. It was very inspiring. Um, I think there are many people across campus doing exciting things, and if we did something like this on a more regular basis, it would allow people who are overbooked to attend uh, future ones. And I know you're doing a lot of great work here in terms of TEP trying to foster this, um, because I, I see a variety of ways to approach online integrating educational technology and um, to have an opportunity perhaps to pursue one of the presenters maybe as a mentor right. might be um, a great uh, thing to help us foster a little bit more of integrating and using these tools wisely. Okay, thank you, Cassia. Sandra. A brief clarification for your case study uh, students perceived anonymity in the chat component. Was that true anonymity in, in that their names were not there, or was it a perception that if I put my name in and you put your name in, I don't know you? And was this, this was entirely optional, participating in this discussion group? Thank you. Yes, it was entirely optional, and I don't know, I had up there very briefly, they get to pick a username when they go in, if they, within the degree of the people can identify them. Uh, my student assistant goes, oh yeah, I know that person, da-da-da, because they knew their username. But, uh, what so motivates your question, Sandra? I, I'm intrigued by, it's not surprising to me that students rewatched it. Uh, that's something that's been evident for um, online use for a long time. But the perception of perceived anonymity is, it was just intriguing to me. If um, if it's real or imagined, I guess, and would that, in if you're really doing uh, educational analysis, would that have changed? If you'd been in a more controlled environment, um, does it make a difference? And that's all. I was just, I was just curious from a, an instructional point of view, if you frame it a certain way and then it comes out differently or if students engage with it differently. So just curious. Yeah, I, I think of it as a way, I, I think it might be particularly attractive to students who are having problems finding their voice, uh, maybe from a, a disadvantaged population or uh, traditionally underrepresented or just people who aren't used to being heard. It gives them a chance to try out their voice. And I think it, it can increase inclusivity that way. That's my hope. Um, 
Hi there. Um, Randy, I have a quick question for you, and then I have a question sort of for the panel overall. It looked like from the statistics towards the end um, that while most were sort of in favor of the VDS, there was a number of, the, the letter percentages are more or less 50-50, and I was wondering if that's something you were thinking about scaffolding to sort of increase those numbers, and in what way would you scaffold to sort of create more comfort level with that kind of participation? And then, and then a general question, maybe for, for any of the panelists, is I teach in a, in a program where we basically don't have the luxury of having grads versus undergrads. We typically have a mix. And I was thinking about, Doug and John, your course in particular, in what ways did you teach to either grads or undergrads? Did you sort of target the grads and hope the grads would sort of rise or teach in the middle? And then how did you differentiate as far as grading when it comes to that kind of platform? Uh, just quickly answer your first question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, yeah, it's a great question. It's one that's frequently on my mind, and I'm engaged with and thinking about and trying to figure out. Yeah, how do you do? How do you increase that? And how can online media be used to increase that inclusivity and that uh, desire to participate and willingness to participate? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So, Chris, regarding the assessment of the students, so uh, what we did with the graduate students is we expected them to take a leadership role, particularly in the field, and also in during the post-production. So in the field, uh, as, a, as we said, we broke up into two teams. There was a graduate student who was responsible for, for facilitating each team, and then in post-production, they were the person in the team who was responsible for collecting all the information that was coming in, conceptualizing it, and, and, and helping the team come to consensus around the interpretation, and then making sure that it was, was posted. I guess I have a question for the group um, to maybe talk about, which would be, what are some of the kinds of possibilities to support these kinds of courses in a networked kind of environment? Because as instructors, I think we've all been alone in doing it, learning from our peers when we can. But the amount of work and time and labor cannot be underestimated, as I said. And I just wonder if the university has a plan as going forward with this in terms of supporting teams or groups of instructional technicians to help out at this level. Um, the university, and actually Doug could probably answer this more um, directly, um, I don't see yet a clear mission for the university to be on board 100% with uh, that. We have other things right now defining our mission, which I hope everybody has been participating in contributing their idea for what is the university's mission. We're in that process right now. And how does that align with excellence and research and residential campus. So there's that piece I think the university is grappling with right now. And how do we serve uh, and build a graduate program of strength and um, keep our AAU uh, status, et cetera. Within the context of that, I am working on a project, which is why Randy handed me this microphone, which has not been publicly announced yet, but we're trying to form uh, an office that would be a centralized concierge service to assist faculty to navigate the very decentralized resources around campus. That there are many resources in pockets, there are people doing awesome things, but nobody really knows where it is or how to get there. And so ideally it would be you come and say, wow, I wanna do this cool thing, and we kinda take a look at what is it you're thinking, and we go, oh, well did you know there's a great Italian restaurant over here, and we'll call and make you a reservation, and then we'll make sure it was a great meal. But, um, but the other part of this, very important, is to then also assess what are the resources on campus. So if we have a huge demand for production with, let's say, video thread creation, and we discover after this year, phase one, that we really don't have the capacity for the demand, then we go back to Doug and say, Doug, we need investment, we need some sort of 
sponsor funding to really support the resources that are in demand. Right now, we don't have a great way to track what are the, what are the needs. And we have a great resource in TEP in terms of uh, teaching effectiveness. We have great resource at CMET in the library. Um, but it's very unclear. People are confused where to go. And so that's one little thing we're doing. But what I'm hearing you say is how can we get some funding to um, help collaborative efforts. Um, I know in AAA we're, gonna, we're funding a RFP for a week long intensive to help develop hybrid courses this summer. But that's one little baby thing. And we hope to see more of that. Uh, this year, TEP, along with Academic Affairs, ca the College of Arts and Sciences, and um, Undergraduate Studies, has a funded faculty working group. Um, and this is, a, I think, a good model for us to take a group of faculty over time um, and work on course revisions together. We've tended to do more kind of one one-time workshops um, or a three-day um, three practicum, but this takes us across um, months together. And I think if that works, um, then that's something that um, we could imagine doing every year and having a community that supports each other in these experiments. I, d I do want to make one comment before I give you the, uh, the intro office. I think it's really important to note it's a collaborative project between academic extension and the library and also with TEP's uh, input. So. It's, it's something that's happening now at a larger collaborative level, which I think is a new direction that we're moving. So I'm hopeful it will sort of be a model for future collaborations. So, so I'm fortunate in the work that I do that I know about lots of good work that's happening across campus in this regard. And part of my responsibility is to try and connect people as I become aware of the kinds of things that they're doing. So this is emerging as a kind of generative activity across campus. I think one of the things that would be interesting to discuss here, and which I think much of what we're talking about here has to do with what, what is the role of endeavors like we've talked about today? What, are, what is the role of online education in a on a residential campus? And I think we're beginning to explore that and have been exploring that. My guess is there, and I know that there are others of you in this room who are doing that kind of work as well. Oh, we got it. I'd just be curious as far as uh, interest level, because I know not everybody that applied for that intensive experience got in. What was the number, what kind of numbers did you get for applications for that, and how many did you end up accepting? Uh, we got 37 applications um, and accepted 16. Uh, we were really happy because people at every rank and across the units applied, so we're hoping that, um, that we'll may the application process was simple, and I think the cohort model spoke to people. Um, uh, and it was interesting because CAS is rolling out its Renaissance grants at the same time. There are other opportunities to, um, to get funding for teaching support, but I think this, the cohort model, um, even though it offered a lot less funding than the CAS Renaissance, we got a lot of applications because of the group um, one could join. Yeah, Sean. So my question, Randy, is uh, can you share sort of your process in discovering new potential technologies to use in your VDSs? Or have you, like, how did you choose Justin.tv? And have you thought about things regarding mobile technologies or things along those lines and what sort of keeps you going? And I ask that because thinking of faculty that perhaps are not as facile with the technology and, and how to help fac faculty learn more about those things. Well, faculty who are not facile with the technology is me. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I'm a, an every man in that sense, I hope, or every faculty. Um, yeah, it is, it's been frustrating because um, I think, I, I come to it in saying, pedagogically, this is what I need. And very few um, platforms are developed that way. Um, yeah, and that, that per particularly that feature that I want, which is time-linked chat, temporally linked chat onto, uh, onto asynchronous streams. As far as I can tell, it isn't out there. Uh, the, the closest thing to it is VoiceThread, but you have to cut your, pro uh, your presentation into little bits and then they can comment on each little bit because you can't link it to a spot in the film. And 
one of, if you have a production crew, you can do a lot, but nobody has a production crew. Uh, so, and, and I actually, you know, I'm working with a grant and I could do it that way and Lynette has helped me with some of this stuff, back there our videographer, uh, but your average uh, instructor isn't going to be able to do, they need to be able to do the production themselves or them and a grad student. And, and um, yeah, it's, that, is, that is the prime challenge is finding user-friendly platforms, user-friendly for you, user-friendly for the students. And I don't know if there's some we can develop in-house eventually. It seems like they should. All this stuff, I'm like, well, that should be out there somewhere. And I keep finding, no, it's not. Yeah. Does that come close to answering? If I can just add on to that, I'm asking a question that might answer that, and I'm looking at Nargis, <laughs> and I'm looking at Helen. Uh, I believe we were thinking of getting media site. Is that still happening, and will that solve some of these problems? Does it have those capabilities? It, uh, media site and other video platforms and solutions are being considered. Um, they're being looked at um, in, I should say, in, um, in parallel, but also following the LMS review because um, a large part of what we do with Blackboard, with Canvas, with Sakai, with D2L, with any of these LMSs actually has to do with a completely different and separate video system that we currently don't have, um, at least not in the way that we, will, that we are wanting. Um, a lot of times when you're uploading your videos the right way that we want to move forward as a campus um, to support you is that that will ma automatically look like it's going through whatever LMS we're using, but actually will go into this other video system. A large part of that is because of the uh, large size of videos, but also the number of videos that we both are using currently um, and that we anticipate using um, going forward um, in terms of storage, in terms of access, in terms of bandwidth, that will absolutely outstrip um, the LMS itself. And you know how big the LMS is for us. Um, so that is something that we're actually doing in the background um, as part of this LMS review. Um, it's our hope that we'll have identified some sort of magic silver bullet solution that um, looks at um, and meets the needs of that entire life cycle. Um, so what we're talking about is not just a lecture capture or a desktop capture or a voice thread, um, but also digital asset management and storage. Um, I mean, if you think about it in terms of what you need just through the LMS, if you, reco um, if you record, create, um, edit, um, produce some sort of video, and you upload that through the LMS for this quarter, you want to be able to use it again next quarter without re-uploading it. And on the backside, our, the IT folks don't want you to re-upload that either. Right? We only want one copy of that somewhere and for you to be able to link that. Those are all the things that we're looking at now. So that's a, that's a long, complicated, but honest answer to your question. So hopefully we will have something. And we are working with Randy to, um, as one use case to understand how, um, uh, how to really address the pedagogical needs and not look at just a simple technology solution. Sorry, there's a back and forth. Um, I'm under the impression that our current version of Blackboard supports video everywhere, but I don't think it's turned on. Is that, can you respond to that? Well, I, it just seems like that could be another partial solution. Because it is only for users to um, capture themselves. For like but it, it includes students. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm compelled to make a slightly different point because I think appropriately the question that you asked was about instructors and students in the teaching and learning environment 
and what role uh, technology or online social media can play in that construct. Just for the sake of discussion, I would say that's one piece of a larger discussion. Um, so when it involves teaching and learning within the environment that we understand, Lisa and I have talked a lot about this, for instance, how uh, a mapping tool might make sense for a writing class. I mean, how do you integrate technology? Julie gave great examples of that. But that is focused on the teaching and learning environment. And then the larger question really is the mission driven. To me, I would offer there's a continuum. And once you talk about technology enhanced education on one end of a continuum versus fully online programs, the larger world out there now has um, state authorizations under federal policies. We have uh, student authentication issues that become uh, much more important, not just from a teaching and learning concern. Randy wants to know who his students are, even though he wants to give them anonymity, but then you want to know who they are for grading purposes. So where does that? But, that, but I'm saying within the construct of your entire course, you've, it works for you to go, you can be Mickey and Minnie Mouse, and I don't care because I care that you're learning, but at some point you care if they learned. So you do have a component within that course environment. But the, the, the federal policies say, um, do you really know if it was a fully online? If you've got a hybrid, you've got an opportunity to kind of bridge that. So I'm just throwing out there that there are these larger issues once you get beyond a course or a series of courses um, to, the, to the online and a fully online environment. So, so we're coming to the end of our, our time, and I just want to be sure that uh, I acknowledge that events of this type don't happen without the support of good people, and so I want to call out my thanks to Lee and Robert Volker Morris uh, from TEP, uh, who helped support this, and also from my office, Sonia Runberg and Gretchen Drew, who helped make this possible. Um, so if we could give them a round of applause. And for, for my own, to assist me in knowing how to think about this going forward, all of you came for particular reasons. It would be really interesting for me in the six minutes that we have left if we could hear from you what you, what you need to support how you would like to move forward in, in the ways that you're moving forward. Six. We got six. So you have to be succinct. Tweet it. Why are you here? Sorry, what? Communication. 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 About uh, initiatives of this type that are happening across campus. Okay, good. Ideas yeah, David. And Ideas and concepts. I always wanted to be an announcer. <laughs> Ideas and concepts to use. Right. <laughs> no, Mike, the one thing that I did get from this was I was intrigued by your discussion of the um, online chat and I have forever wanted some way to be able to have that component and some format for that in classes. So I'm very intrigued by that. Other things we can, we can do to help you. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe offer, I mean, we know from uh, research that's taken place that it's 300 to 400 hours of time that's needed to develop courses in this regard. And so uh, possibly what we need to do is offer more funds to support faculty to do development work and also fund positions to help faculty who want to do development work. Robert? I'd say the add on to the communication component and just hearing what people are kind of talking about their needs is having something that's open all the time for feedback. Because at certain points in time, if you're experimenting with a course or you're developing a course, like an online course or a blended course, you may find a different direction that you want to go and you may not know. And I think this might be what Cassie is getting at with this, um, this resource center kind of thing. But something where we can go and say, you know, I have this need to do what David's talking about with this kind of online chat 
and I'm not sure how to do it. Then that gets directed out to other places. And then I think that'd be important, there's not only that tech support component to that, but also this, this component of what Helen was really addressing, and I think what she was addressing for her question is this component of, I want to, I, I have this topic matter, let's say I'm, I, I wanna do more new media stuff. Well, to me, doing new, more new media within my course, I'd like to do that in a hybrid online format because I think I want them to be immersed. Where do I get the administrative support for something like that? Is there administrative support for something like that? Because I'm gonna take some, I'm gonna take time to develop that. So it's not only the tech support channels we need, we need the support for, in the channels of communication to be open for these larger questions about how to uh, course design. I just want to reemphasize the, um, the availability of the tech support because you can get lots of ideas here. And I can say that I'm over in the College of Ed and Obiverse is over there. And I tried stuff this year I would never have tried in my classes if I didn't know I could walk across to the next building to the, th to the uh, second floor and have some, find somebody who could answer my question before I went into class that night. And so that immediacy of, of support is critical if, we're gonna, if people are gonna be willing to take the leap that aren't tech people. I know some of this exists already, but certainly trainings. I'd like to try out ideas, uh, see them happen, uh, and get immediate feedback without having to make my students be the initial guinea pigs. You know, maybe they can be tier two guinea pigs, but you know, I'd, I'd like to see you know get feedback from those experienced um, to say you know that that might not work. Let's try this. Let's re envision this. And so certainly a centralized office that's coordinating those activities would be fantastic. You know, drop in times, you know, where I'm about to debut this uh, for the first time. Can you walk me through it? You know, all of those things. And I would like to second everything else that everybody else said, <laughs> including the funding, especially the funding. Okay. What is the more, so tech puts on trainings, but I'm just thinking like what, what does a good training look like? Or uh, the, there's this immediacy factor, but, but talk more about what a good training is. Wait, that's the, I mean, You know, I'm, I'm really at the very beginning of thinking about what, what it would mean to teach the kinds of classes that I do. So I teach writing and composition. Um, and so I still have to think about that a little bit more. But you know, I'd love to watch some of this in action um, and then replicate it myself. You know, how does this look? Because I, I, And I do know that uh, Tep puts on some things. But if there's larger, you know, more, you know, even bigger, that more of us... Um, at any rank could go in and have the opportunity to look at this, certainly. One thing I wanted to point out that this clearinghouse, this uh, concierge service or, or some centralized thing might also have is you got to realize that right now there are probably a lot of money's worth of, some number with a lot of zeros after it, of online asset sets that have been developed at the University of Oregon. The instructors moved on. The course is gone. They're out there. They're still on the web. We'll never, they're lost to us. They are lost to us. One thing we can do is start tracking warehousing and clearhousing these projects, clear, clear, having clearinghouse for these projects. We need to keep track, we as an institution need to can keep track of our online assets. So I need to uh, just use the few minutes that are available to thank the panelists Sorry. who presented today. And once again, thank those of you who attended. Uh, please feel free to follow up with uh, us after the official conclusion. And uh, if there are things that you want us to be thinking about, s send them our way because that's how, that's how we'll know how best to serve you. Thanks very much for being here.